Hello, listeners. It's Friday. And with me, as always, is my talented and beautiful hostess, Voice. Good morning, Tim Stradamus, and welcome to all listeners to Friday, where I think I just got a letter from Friday. Dear Friday, I'm so glad we are back together. I'm sorry you had to see me with Monday through Thursday, but I swear I was thinking of you the whole time. (laughs) Interesting. Well, let's continue on, shall we? I'm going to have to have a word with Friday. (laughs) Just saying. Voice and I enjoy reading and talking about stories from the internet that are interesting, funny, and dramatic. Because of a love of stories, we've come together and created this channel to share with you those experiences. And hopefully give you some food for that. Well, let's jump right into the stories while I enjoy my morning cup of brew. Oh, what are you going to enjoy this morning? Something lemony because it's yellow. (laughs) My mind just shut down for a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Something lemony, huh? Lemon chamomile tea. Oh, that's actually really good. It's calming, but still like a little citrusy. Hmm. I think that's a good start for Friday. Well, for any listeners wanting to follow along, all story links are in the description below. And let's get us right into this. For our first story, am I the a-hole for sending my daughter to a different school district so she could be in gifted education? I have three kids. Michelle, seven, Juliet, six, and Leo, two. Michelle and Juliet are in kindergarten and first grade at our local public school. Juliet, however, is very gifted. She came into kindergarten reading chapter books and was doing math at a second grade level. She's obviously doing great academically, but struggles socially at her school for a couple reasons. Firstly, She doesn't understand that other people's brains don't work like hers and tends to get frustrated when people take a bit longer to figure things out. Second, she's just a huge bookworm and would rather spend recess reading instead of playing with the other kids. Then she gets upset that she can't talk about her books with them. I was recently called into a meeting about Juliet with her teacher and the principal of her school and the superintendent. They basically said, that they don't have the resources to support Juliet in her school or any schools in the district. But there's a school two towns over specifically for gifted students from 1st to 10th grade, then for 11th and 12th grade. They have a building at a community college, and she would be taking college courses for high school and college credit. She would have to test into the school, but her school will provide the testing. The school sounds great for her, but it's close to 30 minutes away from her current school. It starts and ends 45 minutes later than her current school, so I still be able to get her and Michelle to school on time, but it would eat up at least two extra hours of my day, and I don't want that kind of time for school drop-off and pick-up, nor do I have the patience to deal with a two-year-old in the car for two hours per day. My husband works in the opposite direction and wouldn't be able to drop her off. We could ask my father-in-law. He sometimes drives the kids around for me, but I don't want to have him do the drop-off and pick-up two hours per day. My husband does not agree with me at all. He thinks I should be willing to make the drive for her and insist that I have the time because I'm a stay-at-home mom. I brought up the issue of having Leo spending that much time in the car, but he says that I could just have his parents babysit. I still don't think it's worth the two hours per day that I'd have to put in to take her to this school, so I went through with enrolling her in our local public school for next year, and my husband is furious with me for ignoring her social and academic needs. Am I the a-hole for not enrolling her in the gifted school because it would take too much time to get her to and from school? So, this is a good get. Not a spicy meatball, obviously, but definitely more like, um, I was with you till you told me you were a stay-at-home mom. That's the break. You have a lot of time on your hands. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that stay at home anyone's mom or dad are just wasting their time because there is a lot to do. If you're taking on that role, you're a caretaker, you're everything under the sun when it comes to the home. There is a lot to do. I get that. But, and I also understand she says that there's a two-year-old traveling with a two-year-old. Ah, that's a nightmare. (laughs) You can't expect any, especially when they're two, to be, to like that. Um, If you've been there and done that, then you probably understand what I'm talking about. But there are parents that can watch the child, the two-year-old. That's where my mind comes back to batting it back (laughs) into reality. If there's a will, there is a solution. (laughs) 
So I'm shocked that you would take, especially as it sounds like she's very ahead of her peers. I think you're wasting a huge opportunity for her. Now, granted, you said that the school would be offering the test. So she has to test into it first. It sounds like, did she even have that done for her child? No. She didn't even have her kid go and take the test. Wow. How lazy of a human being are you? <laughs> Let's at least get her tested just to see if she can get into the school. We couldn't have even done that for her because then all the argument is moot at that point if she doesn't get in, right? But at least you would have done your due diligence as a parent, a caring parent. <laughs> Instead, you hit me with, well, I'm going to be inconvenienced for two hours on the road. Do you know that most people when they're commuting to work, there's a lot of people actually that that two hours on the road is a reality for most. Oh, yes. It's <laughs> awful. It's a reality for a lot of people. So for you to sit there and tell me as a stay-at-home parent, when you have other resources to help you watch the two-year-old, that you can't make that drop off every day? I think for me, at least, stay-at-home parent, you're doing a lot, but you have the flexibility to yes, do, do everything that you need. I would be very upset as the father too, especially if you have such a, in, in your words, a gifted child, right? You have a chance to like... And you have in-laws that are more than willing to assist. Instead, you don't get me wrong. Public schools are OK, but the public school system, we, we know that it's not the greatest. And especially in this, it, we don't even know what state they're in. So I can't even rank them among the 50, right? Unless they say where they're from. They do not. See? So are we saying that you're putting them in public school in the bottom 25 of the country? Are, are we saying a public school system in the top five? Because then, all right, fine. Maybe. Maybe I have a little leeway, but not really. They said that there's a school not that far away. Well, apparently this, her daughter had to have made such an impact to literally have the teacher, the principal, and the super yeah, to have the whole there. village out going, yo, she's special. Get her into somewhere that can help her become Magneto. Like You don't want to do anything about that? That blows my mind that you would at least at least have her take the test. At least see. But you're not even allowing her to take a test that the school was going to provide. Are you high? What's wrong with you? How lazy are you? So, yeah, you're definitely the a-hole. I'm actually flabbergasted at this, especially because you have an opportunity to make your daughter's life exceptional. Well, Reddit's consensus is also that she is the a-hole. And a lot of them can't understand how it is that she chooses her own convenience over the future of her child or the fact that she doesn't have the patience when that's literally one of the things that you need as a parent who's a stay-at-home parent. You need patience. Well, let's go ahead and leave that family to hopefully figure things out. Yeah. And let's see what's going on with these sleeping arrangements. For our next story, am I the a-hole for wanting separate sleeping arrangements when a friend stays over? Okay, so I, 22 female, and my best friend, 21 female, have been best friends since kindergarten, nearly two decades. For the entirety of our friendship, we've had sleepovers, and when we've had sleepovers, we've always slept in the same bed. That's simply a staple of our sleepovers. It's not a sleepover if we don't. We're both night owls, and even once we're done with our activities for the night and lay down for sleep, we'll talk in the dark until we pass out. Now here's a speed bump I've never thought of. My boyfriend just moved in with me fairly recently, and my best friend and I have arranged a sleepover. I casually say to my boyfriend, hey, best friend is coming over, so would you be alright if we took the bed and you sleep in the living room? He was shocked. He says, or best friend can sleep in the living room and we sleep in our bed. The fact that he wasn't cool with sleeping in the living room didn't really shock me. So I say, okay, then best friend and I will sleep in the living room and you can have the bed. He doesn't like that either. He is dead set on the idea that we sleep together and guests sleep separately, but she's my best friend. This has been the routine for years, and I don't really view it as that big of a deal. Even when I had a fight with my mother when I was 19 and asked if I could stay at her place, she let her boyfriend take their bed, and she slept in the tiny ass couch in the living room with me. I would just feel bizarre being like, okay, good night, and leaving her in the living room. I can't describe it. It's just weird thoughts am i the a-hole gasp gasp all right so op has known her best friend for two decades what she says basically 20 years correct 
met in elementary and has been in lockstep with her ever since. Yes. It's a very close relationship. It probably goes beyond friendship. It sounds like this is a actual, she's her sister. Correct. We've gone beyond friends. It would be closer to siblings. Yeah. Yes. I definitely believe that this is a sibling relationship. It even sounds to the point where when the actual friend had a boyfriend at one point, they still kept that tradition on where the boyfriend slept in the bed and then she slept on the couch with her friend when the sleepover happened. So this is definitely something that they kept going and doing even when one of them had a partner. And now OP has boyfriend. OP moves in with boyfriend. The day dawns on <laughs> the situation coming up for her and boyfriend to have this conversation. And she was like, can we use the bed? And he's all like, no. <laughs> <laughs> for her, she didn't even bat an eye about asking. She's because, like, I kind of figured. <laughs> but this is... This is their tradition. This is their friendship. I guess I could understand from maybe someone looking in, especially like a guy that might look at that and go, that's a little odd. So tell me, from your perspective, is this something that would be a norm for a guy? Would a guy have a sleepover? <laughs> Guys have sleepovers. Um, not normally in the same bed. I mean, I guess to that point, though, I guess everyone kind of has a sleepover when they're in tents and camping, right? That's yes. no different than this situation. I, I see it. That would be like a closest as a guy, I think, I would get to sleeping with other men in a bed. Or in the same space. It doesn't yeah. have to be the same like bed. Like a couch. I don't know if the relationship is newer. Yes, at least in the post, she says that they recently moved in. So I have to say that they're a fairly new couple, in my opinion. So is it fair to say that he may not understand the depth of their relationship with each other? Hands down, I believe that's the okay. case. So are we willing to at least say that maybe he's not the a-hole only because he might not understand the depth? As a man looking in, I can understand if you're not exposed to that, then how would you know that that's a normal thing in a in that type of situation when, when someone is that close so at least from a woman's perspective you don't have to be super close in order to have like a bunch of girlfriends come over and hang out and watch tv well into the night talk until everybody just passes out either on blankets on the floor or around the couch sure if anything, I can't fault him for being the a-hole when it comes to not understanding, but it also does it make her the a-hole for putting the precedence that this is sort of their relationship? Well, I would hope that, and that's where it goes back to the question is how much does he know? How how deep does did he get to understand their relationship yet? It was that an expectation she told him that, hey, by the way, I have a really close friend that I've known basically the entirety of my life on sleepovers. She sleeps with me. Or in the same space. I would hope that she gave that to him. And at that point, then it is definitely that the OP is not the a-hole. Like I said, uh, this relationship is very different. They've been friends for a very, very long time. I don't know how many people are lucky enough to say that they're in their 20s and they've had a friend since they were five six are we saying somewhere in there like, yeah that there's said not kindergarten so it would have to be four five or six no you're four or five there is not many people that can probably say that on earth that, that have been lucky enough to have someone in their life that long that's rare um so yeah i don't think she's the a-hole i definitely think the boyfriend needs to be explained the nuances yeah that's exact that's a good way to put the nuances of their relationship and how how much it matters to them. If anything from how she puts it in the post, remember, she says that he is dead set on the idea that they sleep together and guests sleep in a separate room. Okay. So, that's where I'm All right. Well, I don't know maybe... if he's keeping himself open to Okay. these relationships are different. So, he's especially... coming and going, this is how it's going to be going forward now that I'm in the picture. Correct. Okay. All right. Well, then that kind of gives it a different shade of color. She's definitely not the a-hole. That is definitely a conversation that they're going to have to broach with each other seriously because that's going to keep being an issue for the entirety of their relationship if she doesn't. Well, the consensus is that she's not the a-hole. In fact, a lot of people have been going back and forth and they say they can see it from his perspective. Sure. They can see it from her perspective. And a lot of the people who said that they can see it from his his perspective, a lot of the commenters put down, well, you say you can see it from his perspective, but we don't understand how it is that you're trying to romanticize a girl's sleepover because it's done quite often and as just a sense of camaraderie between women. Sure. That's an interesting situation though, definitely. Oh, yes. Well, let's go ahead and leave that one. Let's see what's happening with this relationship for our next story. 
Would I be the a-hole for refusing to pack my husband's lunch? My husband, 35 male, and I, 28 female, have two beautiful children, 5 male and 3 female, and I am currently pregnant with my third child. Recently, my mother-in-law has fallen onto hard times and lost her apartment. My husband invited her to live with us, which I wasn't originally happy about because with the little one on the way, I wanted time to focus on our family, but I ultimately understood that it's a special circumstance. The problem is that mother-in-law has really changed since she got here. We used to have a relatively good relationship, but she's increasingly been demanding and unreasonable. I know it's a hard time, so I've tried to be accommodating, but it's all getting to be too much. For example, she's been asking that we buy specific brands when getting groceries, which would be fine if they were just for her, but she's been insisting that the cereal brand we feed my kids isn't healthy and they have to eat a different brand. The one we buy is the one they like and it's not particularly unhealthy as far as cereals go. She's also been moving our furniture around, primarily the guest bedroom that she's staying in, but recently she had my husband swap the couch and the armchair in the living room while I was out running errands. All this is fine. I love my husband and my mother-in-law and can understand what she's going through so I can deal with it. It all finally came to a boiling point last night. My husband and I have been having a disagreement lately. Usually, my husband makes his own lunch to take with him to work. However, since I recently quit my job to become a stay-at-home mom, he thinks I should start making his lunch along with the children's lunches. My husband goes to work an hour and half before the children go to daycare. I currently wake up around the time he leaves for work and have plenty of time to get the kids ready and make their lunches. If I were to make his lunch, I would have to get up way earlier. We're at an impasse on this issue right now. Apparently, he's complained to his mother about it because she confronted me last night about being a bad wife. In her words, I'm not good enough for her son if I can't even make this one sacrifice to make him happy. Being confronted like this just made me so mad and I don't even know why. I snapped and yelled back at her and said some things I regret. Now my husband expects me to give my mother-in-law an apology and start packing his lunch and neither of them are talking to me until then. My husband and I have never had problems like this before. He's always been so good to me. I'm worried that I'm overreacting and making an already difficult time even harder. I've never snapped like that before, but I just feel so overwhelmed and I don't have anyone in real life to talk to about this because my family doesn't understand my relationship with my husband and don't support us. Reddit, would I be the a-hole if I held my ground? No, hold your ground. But... Uh, There was a statement in there at the very end that kind of has me a little concerned. My family doesn't understand the relationship I have with my husband, so therefore not a part of my life for it. That's interesting. I want to know more about that, but maybe I can come back to that after I start with what I feel about this. Oof. Um, It sounds like everything was great in your relationship till mother-in-law came in. Doesn't sound like mother-in-law has your best interest at heart. It sounds like mother-in-law has come in to take over. She started with the room moving it around. Then she started seeing how much more she could push. She's gotten your husband to take out furniture, swap furniture, without ever consulting you. It's your home with him, correct? Not the mother's home. But it sounds like mommy taking over. That's terrible. Uh, The fact that it sounds like you're isolated and have no one to back you up is also bad. Let me ask this for some clarification. Does the husband have two hands? I would assume so. Does he have two arms? Yes, they are attached to the hands. Okay, okay. Making sense. Does he have legs? I believe so. He was able to swap the furniture around. Okay. So then he can make his own damn lunch like an adult, like the rest of us. That's actually very enlightening. (laughs) (laughs) I just, I don't know. That's an easy one. You're going to complain to your mommy that your wife isn't making your lunch grow up. I don't care if she's a house mom. That makes zero sense. I'm interested to learn about the dynamics of this relationship, especially if her family, OP's family, has said this is not healthy or whatever they said to not be a part of it. There's something weird there. I want to know what that is. Fill me in. I wish I could. Oh, darn it. (laughs) I wish I could, but I did pick up on that too. I... 
It sucks because you're deep into this relationship. You're married. You have a home. You've got two kids and one on the way. Correct. Which is is one of the reasons why I believe she quit her job. This isn't one of those situations where you can just throw a hand grenade and go, well, let's blow it all up. You know, it's there's so much intertwined with this. I definitely would stand your ground when it comes to this. It kind of sounds like she's running all over you. But you also need to set some ground rules and expectations for your husband because it starts and ends with him because he's allowing your mother to come in and basically rule the roost. (laughs) It sounds like um, he's a mommy's boy and that is never, ever a good situation ever. I don't know if there's a win in that for you, honestly, because those type of people who are putting their parents before their partners normally don't change. And also tell him, to grow the fuck up and make his own lunch because you already take care of and it's about to be three kids on the on the way. If he'd like, you know, go buy a Lunchable. I don't know. If you're going to throw some stupid nonsensical stuff out, out let's, let's do that. Go eat a Lunchable uh, and tell your mom to mind her own business when it comes to food choices that you make for your children. My secret guilty pleasure are the pizza Lunchables. <laughs> They're nasty. <laughs> They're so good. She loves them, but they're nasty. I used to love the ones where you could put the chocolate on it with the little M&Ms on top. Oh, God. I know it's awful, but (laughs) just figured I'd let everybody know this. But yeah, you're definitely not the a-hole. Again, I just don't know if you get a win out of this situation unless you get your husband on board with you. And it sounds like he's got a long way to go. Well, the consensus is that she's not the a-hole and she should stick her ground, as you have said. A lot of the points that you've put down is exactly what Redditors were talking about. That one, he needs to be on the same team as her. Yep. It shouldn't be where when there's a problem, he goes running off to mommy and then the friction starts because it does start and end with him. Yep. And that his mom is staying with them as a generosity and she shouldn't be pushing the boundaries. And the fact that she started to and it's taken this long for our poster to go ahead and say something shows a little bit about that dynamic. Well, let's go ahead and leave whatever that whole thing was. And let's see what's going on with this culture. For our next story, am I the a-hole for crying cultural appropriation for the name my sister chose for her future daughter? This is a throwaway because my brother-in-law, 24 male, knows my main and sorry for the errors I am posting from my phone. So my stepsis, 23 female, is having a new baby soon and my whole family is excited for her and this will be the first grandbaby for my mother and stepfather. I, 25 male, am half white and half Polynesian. They are full white for reference. So the story, my family got together and having a good time, we were all chatting in the living room. And then the topic of the first grandchild comes up between my mom and my stepsister. They are talking about what she will do with work and normal expecting talk. Then they start talking about names and my mom starts suggesting names like Sam and Riley. Then my sis says a Polynesian name like Leilani or along those lines. I was a little offended because the name has a lot of importance in my family. It has a very important meaning. I would go into more detail, but the name is so specific they would know who is posting this. She said she heard the name when talking to me. Duh, it's a family name. And it has been on her mind ever since, and she has just fallen in love with it. Polynesian names are very significant to the families and people of those names. In most Polynesian cultures, names tell a story and have a significance to the family. Only certain families can have these names because of respect genealogy and honor like a title. I get that it's not normal here in the U.S., but I was offended that she thinks She can just take a name from my family like that without even thinking about my customs. I feel like it was offensive to my people because she didn't even know where my family is from. I would always tell her the island my family is from and she would be like, okay, whatever. She doesn't know anything about the culture or customs. So I pulled her aside and in privacy told her I didn't feel comfortable with the name she had chosen. I told her the importance of names in my culture and how they have a meaning and I even offered to sit down with her 
and find a story or meaning she liked and translate it into a name of my people so she could still have a pretty name. But it would also not be taken from the culture. Then she got really mad at me and said that it doesn't matter the culture, it's just a name and why can't I just let her be happy? I told her I would never call her child by that name because it would be a offensive to my family and I. Then she got our family involved. They all started calling me a PC police and a snowflake. So I tried to explain to them the meaning of names in my culture. They told me I was in America, not the island my family is from, so it doesn't matter. So I called them some names and they could at least have some knowledge or appreciation for my culture before they start taking from it. I want to know, am I the a-hole for making such a big deal out of a name? Edit 1. I keep seeing I don't own the name. This is why I say culture because back on the island, I am from my family who does actually own the name. You can't name someone that name unless you are in our family. That is why I say I know it's different from the U.S., but it's not like that in our culture. Edit 2. My grandpa said we are proud to share our culture. We'll teach you our dances and share our food, but we draw the line when you start taking our sacred family names. These names are passed down in our family like Americans would pass down war medals or a very important pocket watch. It is how we connect to family and our ancestors. I would be fine with any other name in my culture as long as it wasn't one of these. These names bring great pride to our families. We track them through what is basically a mural that are decades if not hundreds of years old. I would explain it like these names were bestowed or given to us by God for lack of a better analogy. That's what our family names mean to us. My stepsister has no relation to my Polynesian side and has always made fun of my name. When I pulled her aside, I tried to explain to her that the same way she has treated me is how other kids will treat her daughter. I have also been with my stepsister since I was six. Wow. And your stepsister still has this weird almost no not almost very rude viewpoint on the culture correct that is heinous you've been with your stepsister for a long time (laughs) how old are they now does he say she's 23 and he's 25 okay so this has been a while since he was six and she still has zero understanding of the culture and zero respect for him all right or his family roots. i mean she's even gone to the point having her family attack him correct for a name that he's explained in every other way, it is not acceptable for you to give to your daughter. Correct. Now, all right, we'll unload this one because this is this definitely is a cultural thing because they do highlight some important things here. You don't own a name. Fine. If you want to hit me with the basic Americanized version of you don't own things, fine. Because that's exactly what it comes down to. You're right. Fine. You can name your kid whatever you want. There's been some crazy names out there, good and bad. That's your right. It's just how it works here. In America. But he does go to great lengths to explain that that name, that this specific name is very important to them and it should only be given to someone in their family. Stepdaughter is not in their family. She's never been a part of it. Um, she actually has not shown any, you know, they said they'll teach her the heritage, the dances, the culture. Turned it down, apparently. Correct. The foul part of this is she would be naming her daughter that. And then in any part of her brother's life or stepbrother's life, they already said they're not going to call her that. So I do get, again, that you don't own the name, but this is a morality thing now, right? It is correct that you can name your child whatever you want, but morally, especially because you know all the background on it through your stepbrother, should you do it? Probably not, especially when you're as ignorant as you are. I think that's so callous. And um, I mean, I think we even said it a while ago. Names are important. Names mean something. Um, So yeah, I hate that for you. You have to deal with that because you can either go one of two ways because it sounds like your stepsister is going to name that child whatever she wants. She has the backing of her entire family. So it's up to you at this point now to either look at her and go, "Um, I accept it or you walk away because I don't think you're going to get the answer you want. There's no resolution for you. You've done your due diligence as far as educating her, trying to educate her, and she's gone about it her way. So I don't think you're the a-hole for at least trying to be the bridge because it isn't like you were telling her, no, there were solutions, at least in my mind. He was going to help you create a new name that didn't infringe on their sacred family names, right? I I think that's great. He was going to try to involve you in the culture that you have no business being in because you're a step 
sibling who didn't want to be in it, right? That's where I come I circle back to is she has had no support for that. OP even says she made fun of him for it. What? No, that's ridiculous to me. OP, you're not the a-hole in my opinion. So the consensus is that he's not the a-hole. However, let me go ahead and provide a little bit of back and forth between our poster and a commenter. So the commenter said that they thought that he was the a-hole and said, here's a little experiment you should try. Go on Facebook and search your name. There are likely hundreds of people with that name. Now go and tell every one of them that you've been offended because they have your name. Our poster actually answered back and said, the island I come from is very small. When I type the name into Facebook or Instagram, only my cousins and auntie come up with the name. That's how unique it is. Our culture has not had a huge diaspora and it would be nice that once the diaspora starts, starts if people would have respect for what they are taking from my culture. Additionally, they provided some insight and said, I have only told my grandpa and he feels very upset and sad. It was his mother's name. From my understanding in the Polynesian culture, they really do make the names extremely unique so that it's not like any other name. I'm happy that the turd that tried to uh, combat this whole thing with his explanation of looking up names and seeing how many there are, hundreds of them, got a dose of reality. I understood that, no, that's not how that works. Stick to your guns, man. I don't know how you're going to resolve that outside of you guys just don't see her, but I, that's a shame because then that girl gets to miss out on, it sounds like, a dope uncle that would have taught her a lot about the culture. Yeah, there was actually one commenter who said that their family name, which is Tongan, literally connects them to 10 generations of ancestors and that it actually identifies other families, other Tongans out there and shows them how their family has extended. Well, let's go ahead and leave this family matter behind us and see what's going on with this next family. For our next story, am I the a-hole for not catering to my son's girlfriend enough? New account, but I've been reading here for a while. My, 64 female, son, 31 male, was over and I was asking him about his girlfriend of about three years. Now, I've only met her a handful of times, but I know they're serious because they plan trips and talk about buying a home. I asked why she never comes over because it seems like she doesn't like me. I've asked him this before and he never gave an answer, but today he seemed fed up and pretty much told me it was because of me. He told me that I act too weird and intense. When I wanted examples, he told me one. I kept on interrupting conversations she was having with my husband, but it was because I think she was bored. Two, I try to get too close to her during dinner. I would have thought she'd want to sit next to me and get to know me since she can sit next to my son any other time. Three, I wasn't very hospitable by asking her to help with cleanup and not offering her coffee when I offered everyone else. I will admit that is true because I didn't think she'd want any, but he also brought up something I did with his ex years ago, which I've already apologized for. I told him I think this is ridiculous. She's a very smart and capable woman. I told him I don't understand why she needs to be catered to like this. She can get her own coffee. He told me it's not worth trying to explain things and ended up leaving. Would I be the a-hole for doing that to his girlfriend and for thinking she's quite immature for not wanting to come over to my house because she wasn't catered to enough? She may think I'm too weird, but I don't think that justifies not coming over when she's in a serious relationship with my son. Boy, there are red flags all over her writing. <laughs> she already outlines all the problems for us. I would just like to say to listeners, if you can tell me what W-I-T-A-H means, that would be great because I've been trying to figure it out. She sounds very controlling just from the way she writes. So he alludes to the fact that in a previous relationship, he also had a problem with whatever she had done to ex-girlfriend. Correct. But we don't know what she did. Nope. Okay. No explanation. But she even acknowledges that she did something in a prior relationship. And that she apologized for it. Okay. All right. So we know she has a streak and she's aware of it. And now she's not understanding why current girlfriend does not want to hang around her. Is that what I'm getting to yeah. understand? Okay. When she's being, I guess, rude about offering everyone else in a kitchen or whatever. Would you like me to summarize it for you? Yeah. She interrupts her conversations. She asks everybody if they want coffee except for her. She wanted her to help clean up and she wanted her to sit next to her like a child. So she summarizes everything that she's done wrong. So she knows what she's doing, but she's not accepting that it's wrong. It's impolite. 
I'm shocked that someone would be very aware of the things they're doing, but then not understand how that would rub everyone, including the girlfriend, the wrong way. Like not offering her coffee. And then her her excuse was, oh, because I assume she didn't want it. Or she can get her own coffee. Like what? Ugh. This just goes to show me that at 64, you still don't understand the mistakes you're making. I mean, nope. you're, you're very aware of them, <laughs> but they're not mistakes to you. Okay. Well, I can see why the, the OP's girlfriend doesn't want to be around you. OP, in my opinion, you are very much the a-hole. Well, the consensus is, yes, she is the a-hole for everything that I've summarized for us. So she actually goes on to say... That one of the reasons why she didn't offer her coffee is because she thought that she only drank tea. It's a little weird because as a host, would you not have offered tea as an option then? Or at least asked, would you like coffee or is there something else you would enjoy? Now, the other part is people really wanted to know what it was that she had apologized for. And she says, I just apologized to him. It's not relevant. Oh, it but 100% then, is relevant. <laughs> why would you even bring it up if yeah. that wasn't? Actually, based on what I can see, she does let us know what happened when it comes to that incident. She says that the ex-girlfriend was a very anxious person and her son asked her not to invite extra relatives for the first time when meeting to go ahead and make sure that anxiety wasn't going through the roof, but she did it anyway and had already apologized for that. Apparently, this created a huge issue between the son and her when it comes to not respecting boundaries. I mean, I can understand that. I can definitely understand them not wanting to be around her. She doesn't, again, she doesn't sound like a pleasant person to be around. And when you're not pleasant, no one is obligated to spend time with you. That is very true. Well, let's go ahead and leave this family drama and let's go to our last story featuring monsters under the bed. For our last story, am I the a-hole for scolding the monster under my daughter's bed? <laughs> let's hear this. My wife, 54 female, and I, 40 male, are the proud parents of Mary, 4 female. Like most little kids, Mary is scared of the dark and believes there might be a monster under her bed. Whenever Mary has a nightmare, she makes her way from her room to ours, quietly wakes either me or my wife, and says the monster gave her bad dreams. I then walk Mary back to her room, tuck her in again, and reassure her that the monster can't hurt her. Just to prove it, I'll lean down to peek under her bed and scold the monster for scaring her. My wife thinks it's sweet and Mary feels safer. Last weekend, my in-laws were in town and staying with us in the guest room next to Mary's. Mary had a nightmare and we did our typical pattern described above. Apparently, my father-in-law, 75 male, heard me scolding the monster and stopped me in the hall as I was heading back to bed. He told me Mary needs to learn monsters aren't real, and it's time Mary learned how to fight her own bad dreams. I was angry, marched past father-in-law, and told my wife what he'd said. The next morning, before Mary got up, I told my father-in-law he had no right to tell me how to raise my daughter, and my wife backed me up, saying mother-in-law had done the same thing for her as a kid. Father-in-law thinks we're overreacting, but I disagree. Am I the a-hole? Absolutely not, Opie. You're a good dad. You're very lucky because you had your wife's backing. So you guys sound like a very healthy and strong relationship. <laughs> we hear too many of these where one person isn't on the same page as the other partner. So it's nice to hear when it does actually have a good core to it. This is a fun story <laughs> um, other than the 75-year-old trying to step on. What? <laughs> Go to sleep. Like, stop. No, he has no right to tell you how to uh, raise your daughter. She's four. Like, what are we doing? If there's a monster under bed and he wants to scold the monster, let him scold the monster. It, it is a cute story. Um, Yeah, good job for having each other's backs and confronting it. Don't let that stuff get seeded in. And who cares how much longer you have to keep fighting the monsters under the bed for her? That's a great story. Well, all of Reddit also says he's not the a-hole. In fact, I have a small update. Oh. So let me go ahead and get right into this. Well, the judgment on the... Am I the a-hole post has made it clear that the answer is not the a-hole. However, as my name suggests, this is a throwaway account. So first and foremost, I have something I'd like to say. Hi, everyone. Hi. I'm Mary from the story. Let me explain. My family just lost my grandfather's brother, my great uncle. 
and after losing his own dad last year, my father has begun to realize how little time he might have left with our older loved ones. On their way back from my great uncle's funeral, my parents called me just to talk. I'm at college and really busy with schoolwork this time of year. Big papers and tests suck, so I couldn't go. After a bit, my dad asked my mom and I if he remembered when he'd scold the monsters and the story was brought up. He felt like, even though it's been 16 years, he should apologize to my grandpa for yelling at him back then while he still has time. Mom and I told him that was sweet but stupid, and I told him I'd prove he'd been being a good parent. All he had to do was tell me what to write, so I made a throwaway account and wrote what he told me, fact-checking with my mom. However, none of us knew how upset people would get about the monster that once lived under my bed and my grandpa's reaction. Y'all, I don't even know how to thank you for all the kind words you gave. My dad and I have read every single comment, and he feels a lot more confident in having made the decisions he did. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the kindness you all have shown my dad through his story, and would especially like to thank Really Nice Ogre, Throne Magician, Response Mountain, 6580, and USMC Airwinger, and many others, for their hilarious comments about my grandpa and how to keep him in check. They reminded my dad of how my mom keeps grandpa in check and had him, my dad, belly laughing. I'd also like to thank everyone who recommended a book called Hogfather by Terry Pratchett. My dad and I are each planning to pick up a copy, and to everyone who mentioned it, yes, Monster Spray works wonders. I use it for the kids I babysit. They love it. To those of you who suggested my dad made my fear of the monster worse wrong, believe me when I say he tried the it's okay, monsters aren't real, bad dreams happen approach. That failed miserably. I was actually the one who made him start scolding the monsters. And after a few times, it just became part of the pattern. I have very fond memories of my dad in shining slipper-footed armor. <laughs> and to the gross creeps who only focused on my parents' age gap, please shut up and kindly f*** off. You people are disgusting. They've been together for 32 years this July, married for 26 this September. They're just as in love as always and perfectly happy. End of discussion. Thanks again, Reddit. Now, if anybody is a number nerd like me, I took their last post and I added the numbers and I was like, wait, so that would mean his wife was 22 and he was eight years old. And that doesn't make much sense. However, she put it as the perspective of when and they were younger and doing this post, not as current day, okay. they're this old. So currently, their mom was born in 1953. Their dad was born in 1967. They met in 1990 when her dad was 23 and the mom was 36. Dated for seven years, married in 1997 at the ages of 30 and 44, and they are now 69 and 56. I just wanted to make that clear for everyone, just in case they are also questioning the age okay. gap. <laughs> okay, well, maybe that might have just been a misunderstanding by everyone who was reading it. It seemed like it. it they didn't realize that she was actually the one to write the post yeah. as the perspective of her father from back then. That's a fantastically cool post to have given us like this big 16 year like odyssey and that's really cool and then to cap it off he just wanted some reassurance because that's just funny like 16 years later you're like still thinking about that decision that night oh yeah you know what's crazy is that her grandfather is apparently still alive and if she was what six years old back then and it's been he was 74 so that he, would be yeah he'd have to at least be closing in on 100 now good for him and and I mean, there was he's people, crazy healthy. <laughs> it came from a different generation. I can also dig that. Is like if he had come up during a different time period, he probably would have handled it differently. But he's of that generation. I'm not gonna get. I'm not even upset with the old guy. He was just giving his perspective based off of his, his life experiences. So, but there's a hundred million ways to handle every situation. So the fact scolding that scolding the monster, scolding the monster, monster spray. 
Yeah, like, I don't know if anyone can say some, one thing works or doesn't work. Every child is different and unique. So the fact that her father was able to find what worked for her, more power to him. I think that's fantastic. They actually say it's much better that if children are afraid of monsters in, under the bed or in the closet, that as a parent, if you tell them that they need to handle it themselves, because a lot of children feel vulnerable, they feel small and not as superheroish as their parent. And if their parent isn't standing up to what they're afraid afraid of. They feel like, how is it that they can stand up sure. to what they are afraid of? So for a parent to stand up for them gives them the courage that they can be just like that parent one day. And I think that's important to take into consideration when you're dealing with kids is their perception. Our son is more brave than voice. <laughs> yeah, I am. I actually was very much afraid of the dark as a kid, like deathly afraid of the dark. Our son sleeps in straight dark. <laughs> I still don't understand how he does it even now. Was that our last story? Yes, it was. Oh. As I said, the last story with the monsters under the bed. That's fantastic. Well, as our stories come to a close, don't forget, you see in the world what you carry in your heart. If you have enjoyed listening to us read and talk about today's stories, please rate, subscribe, and turn on notifications for new content. We will be regularly posting on Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. So I know our listeners would like to leave their thoughts on the stories, but hold on for just a minute. Bad monsters. Bad. No. <laughs> No, you got to let them say their comments. <laughs> All right, listeners, you're good to go ahead and put your comments in the section below. That was cute. And remember, if you post it, maybe we'll see it on the internet.